is a real exciting time as we explore the power of mass collaboration of average citizens and organizations as a means to gather data. We could not have imagined in 1988 when we started the first assessment in the United States that technology would permit us to track and assess how climate change is impacting our world. In addition to the national assessments, I have also participated in four IPCC reports and the, the one before this one, it was in, called the fourth assessment report, had a unique chapter, chapter one of working group two, a chapter entitled Assessment of Observed Changes and Responses in Natural and Managed Systems. It was the first chapter of its nature in an IPCC report. It ended with a single graphic and Cynthia Rosenzweig at Columbia University was the lead author on this, so proud of her. Um, it ended with a graphic that showed observed changes in biological systems using data sets from around the world. 28,681 data sets globally, but 28,115 of those, 98% were from Europe. I saw that, I said, my goodness, what are we doing wrong? Turns out in the 19th century, starting in, well, from, from 1781 to 1792, in Europe, there was a, an established phenological network. And so the data that people thought was important in the 1700s was reflected in the IPCC Fourth Assessment Report. 452 plant and animal species, um, no, 452 plants and 19 animal species in 21 European countries contributed to uh, an aggregation of all of these data sets for the period uh, 1971 to 2000. And so that big blob of coverage in Europe was due to this. Institutions, non-governmental agencies, and individuals that contributed to this huge 21-member uh, European Union phenology network. On May 6th of this year, the third National Climate Recess Assessment Report was released just after, a month after the IPCC Working Group 2 Fifth Assessment Report came out. These reports are the most comprehensive global and national assessments ever, and it has to do with the data. For the Working Group 2 report, we found, and we did these bibliographic surveys globally by country and uh, by topic, and the, the climate change literature doubled between 2005 and 2010 doubled. So now we have two volumes for working group one, two instead of one. So the, you know, just covering all of that has been a challenge. But both of these reports conclude that human interference with the climate system is occurring unequivocally and that climate change is already occurring, affecting uh, human and natural systems around the world, all continents and across the oceans. And a lot of that information is based on science developed by the kind of non-traditional, if you're a scientist, not universities, not research institutes, but by people on the ground who happen to care about, enough about where they live to make a recording. In the future, our key findings of the National Climate Assessment and the IPCC report, they match very well, and we expect that sea level rise will increase one to four feet by the end of the century. IPCC has a little bit lower, one to three feet, one meter roughly. Um, there's a clear national trend in the America towards a greater amount of precipitation being concentrated in very heavy events. There's more dry days, so the spacing between these events plus the temperature are combining to affect soil moisture and drought potential, not just in the United States, but in Africa and a lot of other parts of the world. Um, the temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit is expected to increase. That will affect human health, the outbreaks of shellfish diseases, and on and on and on, the distribution of species. So the call for a more comprehensive, up-to-date, and inclusive climate impacts monitoring and assessment program has never been more clear. In response, the Global Change Research Program, those 13 agencies, are implementing what we call a sustained assessment process. And I'll tell you that the first national assessment and 
um, several folks that worked on that, Dr. Mike McCracken. Uh, it, we came together and produced a report. It's required every four years by law, as Emily mentioned, but it took us 10 years to do the first one. And we had all these citizens engaged. We had regional workshops, thousands of people engaged. Do you know what happened after the report was done? They all went home. There was a change of administration, basically, and there was no more emphasis on maintaining these networks. So the second assessment report comes due, and the federal government was actually sued for not producing an assessment. So we put one together. There was about 35 of us that wrote it. Very little public engagement. But then NCA3, the one we've worked on the past four years, back again to reconnecting with the public. And I think Dr. Spinrad's going to have some statistics and tell you a little bit more about, about that. This um, sustained assessment process basically means that we won't go home and start from scratch again. You know, IPCC, when you end one report, you have a scoping meeting about what is next. A survey went out to all the UN member nations saying, what should the IPCC do next? It's really a question for policymakers, not scientists. What do you need? Do you need another assessment like we've done five of now? Or do you need special topical reports like our special report on extremes or the special report on water, that sort of thing? So in implementing the sustained assessment process, we envision, the agencies do together, a, more of a steady stream of information for the American public, not just a one-off report that would come out maybe once every four years, hopefully, or five. Examples include a climate and human health assessment report that is currently in progress. You'll see that soon. A USDA technical report on global change, climate change, food security, and the, food, the food system in the United States an ongoing partnership for what we call NCA Net that was an outcome of the National Climate Assessment, the third one. And Emily Cloyd, Dr. Cloyd was the leader of that and did a wonderful job of connecting, I think, how many organizations? 60? Over 150 now. Over 150 different organizations like the National Wildlife Federation, National Audubon Society, and 148 more, at least. <laughs> So we have this ongoing engagement. We also are, are establishing and have already posted this global change information system that our new next topic, Indicators Network, would be served on. And this Indicators Network <laughs> that we're talking about today and tomorrow was recommended by the National Research Council years ago. And this Federal Advisory Committee that we had set up for the um, third national climate assessment they said, you know, we need this indicator system. Why hasn't something happened? So they put together a team that developed some recommendations, and now you're going to hear about this pilot indicator system. So a key difference between NCA3 and NCA2 has been this public engagement, a huge list of authors, workshops that involve thousands of people, NCA net, and this uh, new ap approach for indicators. Now, I've been asked to provide a DOI perspective about citizen science and crowdsourcing of that sort of thing. For those of y'all that don't know much about Interior, uh, we manage, we're the largest land manager in the country, obviously, uh, managing one-fifth of our nation's land mass and 1.7 billion acres of OCS waters, Outer Continental Shelf waters. And as the primary um, manager of these, we have uh, a lot of programs that emphasize uh, monitoring and uh, data and modeling that can help resource managers adapt and uh, mitigate climate change. We're the primary science arm, USGS is, of the DOI with a strong leadership role in climate science. Some of the relevant activities to what you're going to be talking about here, we have a new National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center and eight regional climate science centers. And unlike those that are hosted by the Department of Agriculture, ours focus on natural resources primarily. We also have the national parks as part of Interior, so we focus on uh, uh, monuments and uh, our heritage, our social, cultural heritage as well. And DOI has established these 24 landscape conservation cooperatives that span the entire country. So this is wall-to-wall -wall coverage. It's a little different. In, in charge that the Reese's have that you probably hear about 
which are, are, are kind of topical. Ours are more geographic and, again, focused on natural resource management and cultural resource management. We provide science support to the LCCs through the USGS, and we work on large landscapes, ecosystems, species, you know, what we used to be, I used to be part of the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service when all the Fish and Wildlife Service research was brought in to USGS. So now all of that is part of our, our data gathering and interpretive work. We have had the stream gauging network since the late 1800s, the National Water Quality and Assessment Program. We have Landsat, uh, which is free now since 2008. The, the, the delivery of Landsat images 19 million scenes downloaded so far since it was made free. And I was at our Eros Center two weeks ago. I think this is one of America's greatest gifts to humanity. I truly do. Talk about using from citizens on the ground to satellites with 30 meter resolution of land cover change and that sort of thing. Uh, what an incredible combination. So these provide the scientific foundation upon many de for many decisions by resource managers, and they all depend upon data. We are contributing in this regard to the National Climate Indicator Systems that is being established to support climate resilience through this sustained assessment. It's a foundational, I view it as a foundational activity of the Global Change Research Program. It's new. We established a pilot indicator system, as I mentioned, as part of NCA3 to identify this first set of physical, societal, and ecological indicators. Dr. Spinrad will be telling you a little bit more about that. And the USGS uh, has provided, like the stream gauging network, some of the things that were just easily harvested, uh, low-hanging fruit, they say, for a national indicators network. The pilot indicators that we're going to be talking about here have been developed in collaboration with experts from nine of the 13 Global Change Research Program agencies and the authors of these papers about the indicators, 200 plus from universities, NGOs, and these various federal agencies. Uh, we're reviewing that system now. Some are calling it the National Climate Indicator System, but we really haven't come up with a name for it yet. But I will say that uh, three, the three that are coming from USGS, uh, well, there's several. One is the timing of the onset of spring from the National Phenology Network, uh, the extent of grasslands, forests, shrubland, and pastures from our Landsat data and our stream temperature and stream flow data from our, our USGS stream gauge network. <clears throat> so we uh, support and value the continued development of this indicator system and we strongly urge and feel that crowd-based approaches can and should be play a role in the monitoring of these indicators. Remember that European example. We recognize that crowd-based approaches can provide critical data sets and as I said we've got a long history of that in the USGCRP agencies, even at conservative USGS. We've been around for 115 years, roughly. And uh, in the 1880s, the North American Breeding Bird Phenology Program was conducted through 1970. It's one of the oldest organized citizen science projects in the nation. Six million migratory bird cards are transcribed, uh, being transcribed from that, from that effort. We also have things like, is the ash falling? Did you feel it uh, for local earthquakes? The ash falling is for our volcano observatory network. Did you see it about landslides? Uh, the National Aquatic Invasive Species Program, a sighting program where people report the presence of invasive species. We have a National Map Corps. We have iCoast observing coastal change. We have the Amphibian Research and Monitoring Initiative to where people go out and they listen to frog calls. You can get a tape of the frogs and what they sound like in your backyard and go out and monitor them, report it. One of our scientists is in Ghana right now and he is working with people on the ground in Ghana to, to basically ground truth the Landsat, Landsat assessment of land use and land cover change in Ghana using farmers in Ghana as the verification. So we've clearly made substantial investments in the realm of citizen science. I'm going to end with a couple of concrete examples. One is the USA National Phenology Network, where citizen scientists contribute data that enable the forecast of spring. In Europe, these observance systems showed a substantial shift towards an earlier spring and a later uh, senescence in the fall of many species. 
One, PN, one of our NPN, National Phonology Network, indicators that is in the pilot system is called the onset of spring for CONUS, continental United States. It builds on this legacy of volunteer observations of honeysuckle and lilac uh, leafing and blooming starting in 1956. So we do have some record in the United States and we're capitalizing on that now and expanding it. So we've helped uh, or collaborated with academic researchers to, to use this data to develop models that link leaf bloom and times to meteorological conditions uh, and the onset of spring wherever we have a daily meteorological station close by. Uh, a recent analysis published in EOS enabled by this network showed that the spring of 2012 was the earliest spring in record over the period 1900 to 2013. We have an article uh, in the Journal of Climate that our collaborators and our scientists are working on indicating that spring onset is as much as 30 days earlier across the United States uh, or, or will be by, the, by 2080. We call it the, the parent green wave arriving earlier. This Nature's Notebook that was mentioned, I signed up for that too. I was <laughs> so intrigued by just the, the prospect of that. Um, is one of the our most important programs and of course it's a huge it's not our program Mark Schwartz and a lot of uh, the collaborators back there uh, just tremendous program and Dr. Jake Weltsine we're real proud of his work in the leadership there so our next step is to understand how many other native species of plants and animals respond to variation and change and these large-scale patterns of change and vari variability associated with PDO and INSO, for example. The second and final example is the breeding bird survey. In 1966, our uh, U.S. Patuxent Wildlife Research Center here in Laurel, Maryland, and they collaborated with the Canadian Wildlife Service and um, jointly coordinate this breeding bird survey. And every spring, roughly 2,500 skilled amateur birders citizen scientists and professional biologists volunteered to conduct annual surveys, 4,100 breeding bird routes across the country and Canada, helped scientists establish the spatial and temporal trends in bird populations, and these in turn are now used by the National Conservation Agency for Fish and Wildlife, our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, for uh, developing habitat requirements or identifying them, identifying habitat requirements, shortages, and actually buying refuges and that sort of thing. It counts, you know, more than 450 scientific publications so far have relied heavily, if not entirely, on the breeding bird survey that comes from ordinary people who are trained and care enough to watch for migratory birds. Just an illustration of citizen science that can play a crucial role in science, research, publications, and in decision making in the field of conservation. Our challenges for today, or for tomorrow actually, when you really get to talk about this, is, um, are multiple. Here's, here are some of your challenges. Why involve the public in developing an indicator system? You know, I think it's clear, but what do you think? You know, what is the consensus of people that are in your hand picked to be here, roughly 40 people tomorrow, will be debating this, and we're looking forward to your advice on this or your determination. What are the low indicators of, or low hanging fruit that are indicators for engaging citizen scientists? You know, what's the next step after these pilot indicators? What contributions are citizen scientists already making? What have we missed? We've, we've combed through the federal agencies real well, but what else is out there? And finally, how are web applications and social media being used to promote citizen science? You know, there's a lot of good examples, but not necessarily related to climate. And the second category of questions for you is, what are the key indicators and which indicators are uh, that we need are feasible for incorporating citizen science? How might we connect indicators and citizen science efforts across scales to be able to scale from local to regional or state, regional, national, and international? Do we need to consider standards for data quality and traceability? You know, I think so. What do you think? How important should that be? And what are the barriers and challenges and opportunities we face in the field of citizen science that we can meet by engaging the public? 
We welcome your feedback. This is just the perspective of Interior. We welcome your feedback and um, the roundtable outcomes particularly. And we feel like this will help inform the development of our citizen science community of practice in Interior as well as for the U.S. Global Change Research Program. There's some other things I want to comment on, but just I know I'm probably out of time, so let me just end with saying a couple of things. I'm excited personally about this event, not just for the data, but for helping reconnect Americans with the natural world. I was at West Point with 250 cadets and, and uh, Fulbright scholars last week, and these young people are worried about their generation not being connected with the natural world. Where does our food come from, you know, and how climate change, they, you know, connecting those dots. So I feel like that is probably the underlying value of citizen science, in addition to knowing what's happening on the landscape. I want to commend NOAA for investing the first dollar. You guys put up a lot of money on the, uh, most of the money, for the glue that brought together the indicators network and I commend you all for doing that. The NACADAC for saying, why haven't we done this? You know, and for getting us off dead center. They really did, they, them, them and Noah together. I credit them with this. I also credit Dr. Melissa Kinney and Tony Genetis, you know, for sticking with it and for organizing in the way that you have all of these people, these 200 plus scientists with the peer reviewed literature to back up this draft set of indicators. So anyway, I thank you very much. Well, thank you, Virginia, for the very inspiring remarks. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melissa Kenny. I'm a research assistant professor in environmental decision science at the University of Maryland in the Earth System Science Interdisciplinary Center and with the NOAA Cooperative Institute for Climate and Satellites. Over the past two and a half years, as Virginia mentioned, I've led the development and implementation of the U.S. Global Change Research Program National Climate Indicator System, which is an interagency indicator system to support climate resilience decisions. Today, we're so pleased to collaborate with the Wilson Center to sponsor a workshop um, and this public session focused on citizen science and indicators. And today, I'm particularly honored to introduce Dr. Richard Spinrad. An oceanographer by training, Dr. Spinrad recently joined NOAA's chief scientist, where he drives the policy and program direction for research, development, and technology. Now, he's not a new face at NOAA or a stranger to the federal government, having been assistant administrator of the Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research um, and the National Ocean Service from 2003 to 2010. Among his accomplishments, Dr. Spinrad led the White House Committee that developed the nation's first set of ocean research priorities, and he oversaw the revamping of NOAA's research enterprise. Just before returning to NOAA, Dr. Spinrad was Vice President for Research at Oregon State University. His distinguished career also includes being a research director with the U.S. Navy, teaching at two universities, directing a national nonprofit organization, and presiding over a private company. Join me in welcoming Dr. Spinrad. Thank you, Melissa, for that kind introduction. And thank you for your great presentation, Virginia, your passion, uh, your support over the years. It, it's a pleasure to be part of the federal family that includes leadership like yours. Thank you. Let me also thank all of the USGCRP for the leadership that's been expressed over the last few years, uh, and the Wilson Center, uh, Commons Lab, NCA Net, and many of the collaborators here in the room. Let me also uh, reach out to my NOAA partners who are here in the room or on the web. Thank you for all the great work that you're doing. I stand before you as a New York kid who decided to own an alligator when I was six years old <laughs> and therefore became a citizen scientist at that young age. I, 
I, I won't go through all the details here and now except tell you back then you could actually do that and know that alligator is not in the sewers of New York right now. <laughs> it's, uh, it ended up in the Bronx Zoo of all places. And my, my goal, I think the goal of all of us uh, with respect to the definition or the phrase citizen scientist should be to make that redundant in the sense that the 300 million people who are citizens of this country, and I'm just talking about the U.S. right now, should have a deep and abiding respect for and some degree of participation in the scientific enterprise. And I think what we're talking about here is a great set of demonstrations on uh, how to make this happen, how to uh, demonstrate to folks the value of their input as citizen scientists, but also to challenge the system a little bit so that those students, those kids, or those citizens out there who are thinking about participating uh, see the value, see the impact, and see the benefit of doing that. What I'd like to do is talk about a little bit, in, in the same sort of spirit as Virginia brought uh, to the audience here, the contributions that citizen science and citizen scientists are making to our understanding of climate change and impact. I'd also like to talk about how we can use that power to help build climate resilience in the context of what is a very important mission element and priority for my own agency. And then let's talk about shaping resilience and the role of citizen science. And that's when I'll talk a little bit more about the, the indicators work and the value of citizen science going beyond what has been the sort of paradigm that we've learned about in the last uh, centuries, several centuries, and think about the value of citizen science as an evaluation mechanism as well as a contributory mechanism. So let me start by just taking a few moments to talk about my own agency in the context in the same spirit that you heard from Virginia about the, the critical role that USGS plays in the portfolio of responsibilities and the portfolio of public stewardship that each of us has. NOAA is a science-based services agency and that's important to recognize because our services are really about providing a discrete set of products uh, and value-added products to the public. We are mission-oriented. Many of you may know parts of the NOAA mission around weather service, around marine fishery service. If you're a boater, you know our hydrographic charts that you use for navigation. But the past is not really prologue, and you've seen that in terms of any number of actions that have come out in the last several, several months. Clearly, the National Climate Action Plan is evidence of that, and you've heard a great demonstration of that from Virginia. The Climate Data Initiative, which is really around taking these volumes of data that are coming in from multiple sources, making them accessible to all, uh, including private sector, making the products available for the benefit of the community. You see that in the Climate and Natural Resources Priority Agenda that was just issued last month from the White House, and you see it as recently as yesterday when the Climate Resilience Toolkit was put out for public consumption. If you hadn't had a chance to take a look at the Climate Resilience Toolkit, I urge you to do so. Just go to climate.gov and you can get a link there. It's extremely powerful. It really gets to how can we, if you will, and bear with a little bit of my cynicism, get out of the beltway and help that individual who's trying to start a business in Tuckerton, New Jersey, understand the value of the products associated with sea level rise for her or him to make an adjustment to their business plan, an adjustment to their loan request based on the best information that they have available to them. That's the kind of thing that we want to help contribute to at NOAA. We're emphasizing certain specific priorities at NOAA over the next couple of years, and you'll see how they dovetail nicely with the climate agenda. One is to make communities more resilient, period. Make communities more resilient. Now, there's a lot of layers under that, but the easiest way to think about it is resiliency in the context of social, ecological, and economic resiliency. And I could go on for hours on that, but I think you understand that we're not just talking about building uh, more durable infrastructure. We're talking about how do we make sure that the fishing community in Newport, Oregon, is well equipped for the changes that they're going to see, the climate change induced changes that they're going to see in the biogeography of certainly certain commercially viable species. That's about economic resiliency. It's about social resiliency. Another priority for our agency is to evolve the Weather Service. So the Weather Service as we know it right now was basically created 
through the Weather Bureau over 130 years ago. How do we get to a point where the Weather Service is providing all of the new products and services that are required? So think about what you get when you go to the Weather Service website. And now imagine what do you want from that Weather Service website? What do you want from your Weather Forecast Office 10, 20, 30 years from now? Well, if you live in Tampa, St. Pete, maybe one of the things you want is a harmful algal bloom forecast. That's a little bit different from what's traditionally provided by your weather forecast office. So that's what we mean by evolving the weather service. Another priority is in investing in a robust observational infrastructure, and this gets right to the heart of citizen science. So a robust observational infrastructure. Anybody who believes that we have too much data to satisfy the needs for our data predictions and or climate predictions and projections, please raise your hand and I'll be glad to come talk to you after this presentation. <laughs> we are data depauperate. We need the best observational systems we can possibly get. So in this context, I think you can understand completely what the role of the citizen scientist is in terms of NOAA's priorities. Easiest way to exemplify that is that uh, we have had citizen science as part of NOAA's culture. Now, many people tend to think that NOAA was created in 1970 uh, by then President Richard Nixon. Actually, NOAA was created by a president that goes back a little bit before Nixon. His name was Thomas Jefferson. And it started with the survey of the coast back in 1804, I want to say. The, uh, and so we have evolved over time, but all throughout that period we have depended on what would have been called citizen science back then. The easiest example I can cite is going back to 1890, which is when the Weather Observing Network started. And basically, this was citizen science. And in fact, just recently, we gave an award. We named the award for this individual, a gentleman up in New York State who had been providing uh, cooperative citizen science observations for 80 years, steadily, every day was providing observations, over 100,000 of them. We did name an award for him, so here's the challenge for you. If you can beat that record, we will name an award for you. <laughs> I'd stand here and swear to that. So it, within NOAA, uh, we, we estimate that we have citizen science participation in over 65 projects. And, and we saw the evidence of this. You heard part of this from Virginia in terms of the value and the climate assessment. The specific numbers I have is that for the second uh, climate assessment, there, while there were 30 authors, there really was no outside participation, per se, in the context of citizen science. For the third uh, climate assessment, there were 5,000 people directly engaged, about 300 authors, and 1,000 a, a uh, people providing technical input. And obviously, uh, NCA Net involvement. We've already talked about that. I have 150 plus organizations, so we've got the same number. That's good. The, the value is clearly established. The benefits established. The momentum is there. We see it in any number of different organizations. I think many people are familiar with Zooniverse, the website that uh, in, invokes a lot of citizen science involvement. In fact, Zooniverse has over 1.2 million volunteers. What's made this possible? Well, a number of things have made it possible. The technology, social media allow a lot of that. I have my own MPing app on my phone, and yesterday, in fact, I was in Silver Spring in that same rainstorm, and the only way I could make an entry was if I ducked undercover because it was raining so hard. But if you haven't looked at that, it's about as e an easy an app as you can imagine. You basically log on, you say, it's snowing, it's raining, there's lightning, and that's it. It's in the system right then and there. We already have had, uh, since 2012 when it opened up, we've had 600,000 precipitation reports, and I suspect that's going to grow exponentially. The long-term climate record has also been a beneficiary of this kind of growth in citizen science. The, going back to the Global Historic Climate Network, which includes the GLOBE, the K-12 GLOBE program input, the old weather project back in 2010, there were millions of Arctic weather and sea, sea ice observations that were transcribed from more than 68,000 ship logs going back to 1850. So these are all examples of how we're populating the databases. The data that are provided or the, uh, the, the value of the citizen science is not just in the volume of data, it's also in the quality control. And in fact, one really interesting aspect of this is that the accuracy of the cloud observations that were collected by these K-12 students in the GLOBE program have been deemed comparable to and equivalent to the observations of the World Meteorological Organization. 
which suggests to me we may have a lot of overpaid meteorologists out there. <laughs> The, the data can be collected relatively simply and, and easily. Many of you know the community collaboration on rainfall, hail, and snow better by its acronym COCORAS, and I understand we are, we, are, are people who were involved in that called COCORASians? So they are, okay, good. So we, we have a number of COCORASians uh, here. Uh, this is a, a classic example of using simple approaches with rain gauges, yardsticks, uh, using techniques, for example, like a styrofoam sheet covered with a piece of uh, tin foil to measure the, the amount of hail impact and the size of the hail. Uh, Coco Ross has been a terrific contributor to this and I'm delighted we've got representatives here. It's obviously citizen science is getting more organization. The Citizen Science Association is reflective of that. I want to thank CSA for allowing NOAA to be a partner and giving us a seat at the planning table. And the, the, the NOAA participation uh, I think is something that all of us NOAA folks can feel particularly proud of. It's, it's something that's being built into the DNA. We've been working with the Wilson Center Commons Lab. We've launched the Citizen Science Community of Practice, and we're collaborating with many of our sister agencies on the federal programs for crowdsourcing in citizen science, uh, and obviously in, involved in efforts like the White House Open Government Initiative that supports these kinds of, of activities. All of this basically boils down to say that citizen science is a serious, it's an effective, organized science. And anyone who thinks otherwise needs only look at the impact and some of the kind of gra that graph, for example, that you see right there. This is the kind of evidence that we use in the scientific community of effectiveness, of seriousness, of, of well-disciplined programs. So are we taking full advantage of these kinds of capacities and capabilities? We need to find ways to make sure that these capabilities continue to be supported, that they're integrated into the thinking of the agencies, that they're integrated into educational activities. What you saw with the last climate assessment was the value that citizen science has in enhancing the, not just the data, but the decisions, the data to decisions. So for example, uh, the way in which local data are integrated into forecasts, local data that are required by citizen scientists. In September, September last year, September of 2013, you may recall we had extreme flooding in Colorado and New Mexico. And a lot of the formal observational systems, the flood tracking instrumentation, some of the stream gauges, in fact, suffered. They were washed out by the flooding. There were uh, over 200 real-time reports from volunteers that were integrated into the National Weather Service flood warning system. Those observations from those 200 volunteers were critical feeds into the weather forecast office, those official bodies responsible for putting out watches and warnings. The volunteer data were used in the Weather Service storm analysis while the flood was in progress. And in fact, volunteers contributed to what has been described as the best mapped extreme rain event in Colorado history and possibly nationwide. The value of the citizen science, science input is also recognized in terms of our ability to take research capabilities and transi transition them into operations, or R2O, as we're fond of calling it. And another example we see of that is uh, recently, NOAA, the National Weather Service, has started to implement a new capability. So Doppler radar, as you know and love it, and when you see it on TV, uh, basically until recently didn't take advantage of the polarization capability that you can get in radars. And it turns out you can dual polarize a radar. And when you do so, you get a way of looking at the return, the radar return, in terms of is it rain, is it snow, is it sleet, is it frozen rain? But what you don't get is the ground truthing on that. So as we were transitioning the research of dual pole radar, dual polarization radar, it turns out that the citizen science community was a critical component in ground truthing and saying, yes, you said that was sleet, and in fact it is sleet. And throughout the country now, we are transitioning to the dual polarization capability, and the input from the citizen scientists in terms of ground truthing has been critical. So now let me get into this issue of climate indicators. And this is where it really becomes essential that we have our act together in terms of taking advantage of this 
localized knowledge of the signals that we are seeing. So as you heard from Virginia, this is an active effort to identify that set of meaningful physical, societal, and ecological indicators. Uh, one of the ways I share this with folks is that um, when you think of that filet of fish sandwich that you order at Burger King, you should recognize that that filet of fish probably comes from Alaska and it's probably Pollock. And one way of looking at what's happened with the Pollock species is that what was Alaskan Pollock is now Russian Pollock simply because they are migrating. So you talk about an interesting indicator with economic consequences, the capability of understanding the biogeography of critical commercially viable fish species, which is in the wheelhouse, if you will, of NOAA, is one of those indicators that we need to understand. And where are we going to get that information? It's not going to be from a single ship going out there monitoring and doing stock assessments. It's got to come from working with the fishing community, with the local communities as well. Another good example of the value of citizen science in the context of indicators comes in the recognition of ocean acidification, clearly a climate change indicator. Where did that first come from? Where did the first recognition come from? Well, some of it came from researchers going out there with sophisticated measurements of, of pH and pCO2, but the real signal bell came up when especially the Pacific Northwest shellfish hatcheries said, hmm, we've got a problem here. And the problem was not due to temperature, which was the thought first. It was not due to viruses in the water. It took some time to finally recognize that it was a consequence of the slight lowering of pH, that is the slight acidification of the intake water they were using for their brood stock for uh, uh, oysters and, and mussels. So the development of a national climate indicator system uh, is essential, and it, it's essential to the sustained assessment activities that Virginia alluded to. And it's, and I'm not going to repeat all of the great arguments Virginia made about the role of the agencies and the, and the importance of the agencies and, and the, uh, the, the nature of the engagement to develop this. And I would simply say, if you have not seen the article by Charlie Kennel and his co-author Victor uh, in Science about a month ago on indicators, and basically the gist of it was, Two degrees C is one thing, but that's like measuring your health by just taking your body temperature. We've got to look at the full set of vital signs. So the takeaway from all this, and my conclusion is that we need your help. We, the federal agencies, we, America, uh, we, the community at large, uh, we need your help in terms of developing the indicators, the concepts of the indicators. Uh, we want to do our part in the agencies to make possible the capability to incorporate citizen science into this activity. But there's another aspect. What I'm really talking about is a bit of a sea change. And the sea change is going beyond the role of the citizen scientist as that wonderful additional collateral acquirer of data to a role as an evaluator and a key player in the products and services. So not simply saying we will go out and measure where the fish are, what the sea surface temperature is, but what do you think of this set of indicators and how valuable is that to you and how in your community can this particular network of climate indicators in the system of climate indicators serve as a useful tool for the applications that are central to your lifestyle to your, uh, your community per se. So I hope what I've been able to do is convey to you that uh, citizen science is critical in the development of the National Climate Indicator System and that thus far we have relied uh, quite a bit on the role of citizen science in terms of data, in terms of the assessments, certainly what you heard with respect to NCA and some of the products and now I believe that citizen science and citizen scientists can commit even further to this, to the evaluation of pilot prod products and the initial set of indicators with the co-goal or the, the, the goal of co-ownership of the National Climate Indicator System consistent with the best practices that we know are coming out of social sciences. To that end, again, my commitment, NOAA's commitment, is going to be to continue to make the, da the, the data and the systems available, actionable, 
and to keep our ears open and our expectation is that you will join us in this co-ownership and co-design of a National Climate Indicator System. Thank you very much. So if Virginia and Rick wouldn't mind coming to the table, we have about um, an opportunity to ask three or four questions before we get started with the, the panel, if you all would give us a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll welcome any questions from the audience here at the Wilson Center. We also welcome those of you joining us on webcast to send in your questions. Um, does someone in the audience want to start us off with a question? And I would ask for those of you, please speak directly into the microphone so everyone can hear you. Right. <coughs> My name is Donald Burns, uh, South China University of Technology. This is all very exciting, uh, and uh, I'm glad to see all that this is taking place, and I've had a small part to do with it here in the United States. Are there any actions now or plans to involve uh, citizens around the world, such as in China? In the National Climate Indicator System, this, this uh, whole place, the holding name we've got for it right now, there is no uh, um, international uh, effort like that, no. Uh, Melissa, do you have any, I don't think we've no, even I mean, talked about any sort of. For that, it's, it's focused on the U.S., but that doesn't, you know, constrain what people can do internationally, and I think that that's a real opportunity to really think through it so that we'd have indicators that could be compared to those that are in the U.S. so that you could have country-level indicators in China or in other countries that would help the citizens of those nations. Yeah, it's a, a, an enabling capacity of people to understand what climate is doing or how climate is affecting systems. So, you know, if we talk a lot about uh, science diplomacy and with the U.S. producing, you know, a quarter of the emissions to the date and having such a small segment of the population, the need to help uh, the developing world particularly, that will be uh, disproportionately impacted by climate change, okay? because of their lack of institutional capability, but also their lack of understanding. In this bibliographic or bibliometric study that we did for uh, AR5, most of the literature is coming from North America and Europe. So the developing world, very tiny percentage, less than 5 percent in the whole continent of Africa, for example. I, I think the uh the point I'd raise is that you can imagine that obviously these are global problems and obviously we are talking about a national capability here and and there's potential for an, an, an a huge set of bilateral and trilateral a very complicated set and so what we tend to do is is to rely on those existing entities that have established mechanisms for working across various member states. So the World Meteorological Organization, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, uh, and the Group on Earth Observations, GEO, are the places to have that discussion. And, and my view, I would go back to my boss, Kathy Sullivan, and say, let's have this discussion in that context rather than trying to develop individualized mm -hmm. solutions from nation to nation, which could get very complicated and cumbersome very quickly. But the model that we're talking about is certainly uh, transferable, I would hope. Mm -hmm. um. uh, Mike McCracken from the Climate Institute. Um, I, I would just say China has many indicators. I mean, they've been doing phenology things that go back thousands of years, so they, they have a lot of indicators. Um, my question is really, given all of this effort, how do we avoid the problem of decision makers basically saying, oh, I need more and more data until I act, that everything is so uncertain, um, that I want more and more indicators? Um, that's sort of what's been going on in this field for a long time. Uh, I mean, the first pr report to the president was in 1965 on it, and we need more and more information, and we keep 
waiting, it seems to me you need to find a way of framing it so that maybe there's some really early indicators or the long records are used to really get across to people that we need to act. We've been waiting a long time. So uh, my answer to that is I hope we're not going to wait for policymakers to act before action takes place. And I say that somewhat in jest, but what I'm seeing is that uh, where action is being uh, uh, stimulated, if you will, is coming from different sectors. It's coming from industry, for example. Uh, there was a very interesting article in this week's Economist about uh, the communities that are dependent on water, and uh, the industrial communities dependent on water, and, and it, it's basically every industry. And so those communities are now saying we can't afford to operate if we don't have a better understanding. Can't you give us a seasonal to interannual forecast on drought and water availability? Uh, the other uh, sector we're seeing, I think, is in uh, uh, specific regions and jurisdictions that are demanding uh, particular capabilities. And the classic example right now that I, I'm sure you're familiar with, Mike, is down in Norfolk with the Department of Defense, Department of Navy, uh, who are simply saying, we don't need any more indicators. Thank you very much. We've got what we need. We've got to, we've got to make the appropriate adaptations to the base in light of sea level rise and nuisance flooding that we are already seeing. And I think as more people see the Department of Navy making changes to their bases, as more people see uh, industry making specific investment decisions based on this information, uh, they're going to say, okay, so we have enough indicators to solve our particular problem. That's my hope. Yeah, I would say the same thing um, that we see in the adaptation chapters, the four adaptation chapters in AR5 and in our national climate assessment and all of those documents that underpin that, one for each region and one for each sector, and uh, separate assessments on our status of adaptation. So I do see in the realm of adaptation, like natural resource managers, you know, when you're buying coastal lands for national parks, considering future rates of sea level rise. We see a lot of that already. That's in the adaptation realm. But in the mitigation realm, um, perhaps, you know, there, that's where that question's more relevant, I think. So do we have time for one more question? So let's take one more question while the panel just preps themselves to, to come up for the transition. Hi, good afternoon. Henry Regis, uh, National Coordinator for Kokoros. I've got a question uh, for citizen science networks. As we see them being integrated into many different places, the data being used, uh, what for sustainability for these networks? So the funding, a lot of the, the, we, we come up and we ask ourselves this question as well. Many of, of different products from different networks are being integrated now. How does a how does an organization, or if you guys have any ideas, to keep the the these different citizen science projects going that they don't fade into the, into the darkness as as uh, as they go along I would say not to rely on federal support just honestly <laughs> you know honestly <laughs> just from my experience and what I've seen I I think that it would be uh, you know like in use in the European example you know it's more, it, it's more sustainable, more resilient, uh, more likely to succeed if it's built on people's interest and will to deliver something that they believe helps uh, in the stewardship of things they care about. Or just for the matter of pure science, what's happening? You know, what are the trends? You know, when did my azaleas bloom last year? What about the past 20 years? You know, that's sort of the, you know, capitalizing on the natural curiosity and conservation ethic that I think that's the way to make it more successful and not to rely on a government agency to pay you to do it. I'd have to echo that as the primary answer. The other one that I think is inherently obvious is there has to be a value proposition to that. So the Weather Observer Program, the reason it's sustained is right not because of federal funding, but because there's a recognized value. And in, in, in terms of the people who are providing the observations, hey, gee, if I give a pressure and temperature and, and uh, rainfall uh, uh, datum into the National Weather Service, that's going to help their forecast for my area, so I'll, I'm going to do it. That, that's an important element of it. Well, join me in thanking Dr. Virginia Burkett and Dr. Richard Spinrad.
And I'd like to invite the panel to come up. Good afternoon. I'm Jen Gestetic. I'm your moderator for today. Um, I'm the Assistant Director for Open Innovation at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Started in that capacity about two months ago. Prior to that, I was the Prizes and Challenges Program Executive at NASA, working on a lot of their citizen science crowdsourcing and prize programs there for the last um, few years. So uh, we have a esteemed panel of practitioners today uh, for the rest of the afternoon. So I will only spend a few moments um, punctuating some of the points made um, earlier by um, our fabulous keynote speakers that had a lot of wonderful insights and said a lot of my talking points, so I am going to be short so we can get really into the meat um, of uh, the discussion and the case examples from our practitioners um, uh, today. Um, uh, as, as many of you um, likely al also know, the administration has taken steps um, in the last couple years to not only um, uh, support uh, many of these climate initiatives uh, that we've been talking about today, but also more, uh, uh, more outwardly support citizen science and crowdsourcing tools as tools for the federal government. Um, and the second uh, National Action Plan for Open Government was published in 2013. That was specifically one of the commitments uh, that the U.S. government made um, to the uh, uh, to the Open Government Partnership was that, that we would be increasing uh, agency use of citizen science and crowdsourcing um, across the U.S. federal government. And we committed to developing an open innovation toolkit um, to better enable folks uh, at the federal agencies to leverage tools like prizes and challenges, as well as citizen science and crowdsourcing. So um, uh, before was mentioned the uh, working group uh, that is chaired by Leah Shanley and Jay Ben Fernando in the room from EPA and from NASA. Um, those two folks have been working to um, convene a group of practitioners from around the federal government, almost 100 people now, um, from 20 federal agencies um, that get together regularly uh, to talk about how we might um, encourage uh, more of these projects at the agency level. Uh, with that group, we're working on developing a citizen science and crowdsourcing toolkit uh, for the web that will enable even more folks across the federal government uh, to leverage these tools um, moving forward in a variety of domains, including climate. Um, in addition to all of the great um, uh, work that you've heard of today already in uh, policy documents and administration priorities related to climate, I'd like to also offer a couple other um, uh, kind of taxonomies for framing as we start thinking about um, how these different types of tools can fit into uh, a, a plan for leveraging uh, citizen science in our indicator work. Um, uh, as we just heard, there's a number of different ways in which citizen science can be used for data collection, for processing of data, for evaluation, and also for people setting their own research questions, testing those research questions, and then advising um, outcomes and uh, policy stances based on those questions that they help to frame. Um, and there's a number of different goals uh, that one can achieve through a citizen science or crowdsourcing uh, program, ranging from science goals to management goals to action goals education, conservation, monitoring, restoration, outreach, stewardship, discovery, and the list goes on. There are a lot of different ways in which you can use citizen science and crowdsourcing. I say with my other hat on, um, if you've seen one prize, you've seen one prize, because they're all very, very different. Same is true for citizen science projects and crowdsourcing projects, um, which makes the nuances of the ways that each one um, are designed non-trivial, um, but also means there's a variety of different ways that you can apply the elegance of one project potentially to um, some of the difficulties of another. Um, so as we uh, jump into the panel uh, today, I would like to uh, encourage each of the panelists to not only share explicitly what the goals of their particular uh, project um, or set of projects uh, was that they were working on, um, but also um, any of the powerful outcomes that tied to those goals that they found. Um, one, one, for example, that Jennifer shared um, uh, before um, uh, this morning, before, b before coming this afternoon, was um, one from uh, Cornell where using 3,000 Cornell Nest record cards, these spanned from 1959 to about 1991, researchers showed that tree swallows began laying eggs nine days earlier 
a shift uh, due primarily to increasing surface air temperatures. So a very clear science outcome or science finding that was derived from citizen data. Very clear. Um, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to make sure that they talk in terms of outcomes as well um, so that we can start to see kind of um, uh, the many ways in which, whether it be for science outcomes, for monitoring outcomes, for management outcomes, how we might be able to think about leveraging citizen science and crowdsourcing in this space of climate and climate indicators uh, in our um, ongoing planning. So with that, um, we will start at the end and move this way. And if you guys can each say, um, 30 seconds about yourself before you get into your project. Thank you. Great. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tim Watkins from the National Park Service, and I'm part of the Climate Change Response Program, which is a national level program um, that supports parks around the country in um, building capacity for science and stewardship and adaptation mitigation and communication around climate change. Um, my entree into um, citizen science actually began um, several years ago in my previous job working at National Geographic where I was the coordinator of a national um, bioblitz effort in conjunction with the Park Service. And am I jumping into my PowerPoint at this point? Let's go ahead and do quick intros first and then we'll jump into the PowerPoints. Okay. Good. Go ahead. My name is Julia Parrish and my day job uh, is that I'm an associate dean in the College of the Environment at the University of Washington. Uh, and so I uh, spend my days trying to tell faculty what to do, and, and they don't pay attention. Um, but my nights and weekends job and my passion is that I am the executive director of the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team, which is a 16-year-old citizen science program in which thousands of incredibly committed people walk the beaches and look for dead birds. My name is Jennifer Shirk. I'm based at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in the Department of Program Development and Evaluation, which looks uh, primarily at the design and the outcomes of citizen science projects um, at the grand scale, so a field-wide perspective. And at the moment, I'm also involved, as are a wide range of other folks, some of whom are in this room, in the development of the Citizen Science Association. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Duncan McKinley. Um, I'm a policy analysis um, with in R and D, our research and development with the Forest Service. And um, how I got interested in uh, citizen science, um, I'm going to tell a little backstory during um, my actual presentation. But the uh, deputy chief, uh, chief of research, uh, in, uh, for the Forest Service, came to me and just was really excited after attending a conference way back in 2007, and she asked me to look into it for the for R&D and for the agency as a whole. So I've been doing that ever since, um, off and on, so. So we've got a lot of brain power <laughs> and a lot of experience um, at the table today. So um, we'll go through their, um, their quick remarks, um, five to seven minutes each for their remarks, and then go straight into questions, because I'm sure that you guys have a lot of questions that you'd like to dig into these folks' minds on. I know I do. So if we want to start at this end. That's the last slide, so yeah. I could talk in reverse. And if I use this, do I need to point it right there? <laughs> we'll try it. We'll see what happens. I won't push the red button. I think that's a laser. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, Emily asked us a really, to address a really, really, really important question, which is how citizen science helps people make connections between climate change and impacts that they see in their own communities. And I think it's a really, really important question, but I think, um, to my knowledge, there has not been any sufficient rigorous evaluation um, around that. And Jen, I would love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Um, and I think that sort of evaluation really needs to be done. But that said, in the meantime, for the next couple minutes, what I would like to do is paint a picture of national parks as places um, that have great potential to help people make those connections through citizen science as well as other activities. Um, and I say this because uh, national parks are the places that people love and care about very, very, very deeply. And when people visit a national park, their minds and their hearts are really open to experience and information and feelings. And so a park visit 
provides, I, I think, unparalleled opportunity for both emotional and intellectual engagement, which of course is exactly what research on climate change communication says is so important for people to understand climate change, believe in it, uh, and become willing to act on it. So um, let's explore national parks for just a little bit. You're all scientists, so I thought I'd throw a data slide up here. This is the only one, though. So um, several years ago, uh, or a few years ago, I should say, Park Service partnered with um, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, National Parks Conservation Association, Colorado State University, to do surveys of park visitors and also park staff about their attitudes around climate change. This is funded by National Science Foundation. And the upshot here is that visitors to national parks really do care about climate change, and they're deeply concerned. They want to know more about climate change, even when they're visiting a park and they're on vacation. Their vacation is not ruined by learning about climate change. Um, that, was a, that was a big revelation, right? Um, it was the issue that was not to be addressed. Um, but it turns out we really can talk about it, and we should. Uh, and furthermore, they're willing to change their behavior. And so if you look at this, 61% um, uh, of these respondents agreed or strongly agreed that they want to learn more. 57% um, agreed or strongly agreed that effects can be seen in these places that they love so much. And an astonishing 67% said right there on the spot in the park that they were very willing or extremely willing to change their own behavior. And so this audience is ripe for engaging in citizen science around climate change impacts. And so I want to just walk you through a couple of examples of citizen science projects related to climate change that are going on in national parks. And these are being run by or associated with our research learning centers, uh, which are facilities and programs and places in parks um, that support and facilitate scientific research in parks and then connect that science to education and interpretation. So in, in short, what RLCs do, research learning centers do, is they make science part of the visitor's experience. Um, and they're great places for doing citizen science and just generally supporting science and public, uh, public engagement around the NCA. And I think there's a great power in bringing people into parks, exposing them to citizen science, climate change impacts in the places that they love, and then enabling them to um, take that home with them into their homes, their communities, and their schools. Okay, Glacier National Park in Montana um, <clears throat> has been doing citizen science for decades now, um, chiefly on making observations for particularly important wildlife populations and how they are, uh, or that are sensitive to climate change, uh, in particular loons, pikas, and mountain goats, and observations are based, uh, or are made on phenology, distribution, population size, behavior, reproductive success, and so on. There's a nice quote here um, from the person who directs uh, the citizen science efforts in the park. Uh, this is the Crown of the Continent Research Learning Center. Um, participants can see the glaciers melting, you know, we can all see that, but what really gets them is when they're able to help uh, collect data on the impacts of that on wildlife that they love so much. A little bit about outcomes, um, a couple of peer-reviewed papers using citizen science data, one showing um, conclusively that the quality of citizen science data is just as good as that collected by real scientists. Um, over 900 participants uh, since 2006, about 150 per year. Um, the loon data have been used to develop some statewide conservation goals. The loon is a species of special concern in Montana uh, and are used in decisions that are made in the park and elsewhere about lake trout removal projects. And I would love to volunteer for a lake trout removal project. <laughs> um, the Smokies, another park where there's uh, a lot of citizen science. Um, some of the folks who are involved in this are the leaders in the park service on citizen science. A lot of it is phenology, um, uh, plant flowering tree phenology, uh, but also salamanders. The Smokies are the place in the world with the greatest um, um, uh, number of species of endemic uh, salamanders in the entire world, and so understanding them is a high priority. Um, about 2,000 people per year 
participate in various types of citizen science programs. And this includes um, teachers, several teacher training workshops. So just in 2014 alone, um, uh, 150 teachers were trained in workshops on how to do citizen science uh, phenology monitoring in the park and enabled and given tools and guidance on how to do that in their own um, schoolyards. So it's nice to see that be exported into local communities. Um, the person who organizes this says that students um, who come in and participate, they ask them about climate change and those students all talk about polar bears and melting ice caps and that sort of thing. But by the end, they start talking about local impacts and they're quite um, clearly made much, much more aware about impacts on salamanders and local flowering plants. Um, Acadia and Maine. Some of you know uh, Abe Miller Rushing, who's the science coordinator and affiliated with this uh, research learning center called the Scudic um, Education and Research Center. Lots of plant phenology and bird, um, migratory bird phenology, as well as ocean acidification. Um, one of the nice things about this is what Abe sees is that people get really excited when they realize that their own, um, their, their own records historic records that they find, you know, old photos that they find in their attics or their grandparents' or great-grandparents' journals actually have tremendous value uh, and can be used uh, to inform science and stewardship and understand changes over time. And it makes me think that citizen science practitioners really should um, start thinking about having like an antiques roadshow for <laughs> citizen science where people bring in, you know, these old photos that they found that belong to their great-grandmother and you're there with a scanner, and you're like, God, this is great. We could really get something out of this. Um, and then just get the cameras rolling, and boom, you've got a nice story. Uh, and then finally, um, scaling up outside of individual parks into networks of parks. Um, one shining example of this that involves seven national parks, um, UC, University of California Research Reserves, and I think at least one or two um, California state parks is the California Phenology Project that's done in conjunction with the National Phenology Network. Um, and this is training and engaging people all around the state of California to monitor um, 30 species um, and over 760,000 records, observation records, uh, have gone into the National Phenology Network database from this project alone, which represents about 20% of all the records in the NPN database during the years that the California Phenology Project has been active. Um, we're building on this by um, coordinating some efforts with partners along the Appalachian Trail, which is a nice 2,200 mile, um, 11 degree latitude transect uh, that presents really wonderful opportunities to engage people um, in a fairly uh, population dense part of the country. And I will end there. I think my eight minutes is up, but um, there we are. Climate Change Response Program and the Research Learning Centers of the National Park Service. Am I can't look behind me. <laughs> Excellent. That's the end. I like moving in Close your eyes. <laughs> 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 well, I'm I'm really happy to be here uh today. Um I don't get out of the Ivory Tower very much, so it's great to uh to come to ZC, thanks to the Wilson Center and thanks to the Commons Lab um, for the invitation. So as I said before, I run a dead bird program uh, and it's called COAST. Um, and I invite you to uh, look, look us up at www.coast.org. So um, we are in COAST 16 years old. Uh, we've trained about 25 um, hundred people. We have 850 current participants who go out on the beach every month, rain or shine, to collect information. Sometimes it takes them 11 hours and they still do it. Um, we monitor about 450 sites from Mendocino in Northern California all the way on up to Kotzebue uh, in Alaska and over to the Commander Islands, which are actually in Russia. Uh, we found about 50,000 carcasses. Imagine this, people going out month after month to look for um, things that are partial and maggoty um, of over 167 species. We are 
the Macaw Nation. We are the Aleuts. We are retirees in Oregon. We are grandparents. We are grandchildren. We are everybody on the West Coast. Uh, and this is what they do. They go out, they find a bird, they figure out what kind of foot it has, they make three standardized measurements, uh, and they take a photograph. It's really easy to photograph dead birds. You can fill the screen uh, and even put a scale reference in. And with these pieces of information and um, field guides and some other materials, they can make a species identification that is not based on guesswork, but is based on deduction. And this is the heart of COAST. It is rigorous citizen science. It is standardized, it is effort controlled, and every single piece of information, deductive information, the species identities, can be independently verified, and every single species identity is independently verified. So with these pieces of information, they know they've got it right, we tell them if they have it right, and the data are immediately useful in science and resource management. So one of the things we do, apologies for a dark slide, um, uh, is to create a baseline. So a lot of COAST is about establishing a baseline. If you're looking at the months of the year here, and I've broken it in the spring, this is June, um, this is the average encounter rate if you're walking in a beach in northern Oregon, for instance, um, what you might expect to see. So the filled in part is all carcasses combined. And basically, this is what you see on the west coast. Um, you see a peak that's post-breeding mortality after the breeding season. Um, you see a peak in the winter, that's winter kill, and we're starting to see a small peak in the spring. This actually didn't appear when we first started Coast, um, so this is a more recent phenomenon. And I've just put up some of the more common birds here uh, that people find in these peaks. Common murres um, in post-breeding, northern fulmars, those are migrants down from Alaska um, in the wintertime, and rhinoceros auklets. Center of population there is in British Columbia um, as they migrate back on up. So, how do these data actually speak to climate and climate change? Well, um, I'm going to tell you three very short stories. The first one is just documenting um, climate impacts. What we've been able to show with the coast data is that um, when we have late upwelling event, that leads to colony abandonment of seabirds, um, which puts seabirds in the path of salmon gillnet fisheries if they migrate into Puget Sound earlier. So we've done a lot of work that suggests that when we have a climate event that's happening actually out here earlier in the spring, what that does is change the migration pattern of birds, and we end up with a lot more dead birds on the beach in Puget Sound, in greater Puget Sound. And so our volunteers can monitor that, um, and uh, this is a story that's been published. Um, we can also um, look at uh, warmer fall ocean events which lead to massive harmful algal blooms, um, and Dr. Spinrad uh, mentioned those before. Um, certain kinds of al algal blooms will lead to the death of not just hundreds but thousands of seabirds. Uh, the COAST uh, program in 2009 documented the largest seabird mortality event due to a harmful algal bloom anywhere in the world ever. Uh, and that's because we had people on the beach that were doing those regular monitoring events. Or how about um, delayed upwelling and warmer oceans leading to starving seabirds and marine mammals in 2005? We had a massive, massive mortality event of marine mammals and seabirds uh, all along the um, Pacific Northwest coastline, and that's because we had a delayed um, upwelling event. This made it to the um, top 100 science articles. I was actually um, interviewed by beauty magazines um, because everybody was really interested in, in dead birds. Um, <laughs> go, go figure. So um, coast can involve people in science teach people our basic concepts of science. That is, it has to be rigorous, right? It has to be rigorous science. Get them out there collecting data about their own local communities. Connect that data directly to scientists and resource managers, and then give it back to those same volunteers so they can see what's happening. But science alone is not going to save the world. 
So this is normally what happens in science. We scientists make up a project, they do a bunch of things. Sometimes they get participants to collect data and they publish it. And publishing in science doesn't actually often result in a quantifiable positive effect in the population in a habitat or in a system. But citizen science can do that. Because with citizen science, we can involve agencies and NGOs. We can give the data to resource managers. They can increase enforcement. They can talk to decision makers who can actually change rules that can have a positive effect. Or the media can help with that. In citizen science, we can talk to the media, including beauty magazines, um, and they can push that even to the national media that put pressure on decision makers that change rules that have a positive effect. Or citizen scientists themselves can call people up. About 30% of our citizen scientists have talked to politicians in their home states about the COAST program. I mean, can you imagine calling up the governor and berating him about the rate of dead birds on the coast? If one person did that, they might be crazy. But we have 800 people um, that are doing that. And all of these things together actually create that theory of change that moves what scientists start to a happy ending. Thank you. I'll sit. I can actually see from here. So. Thank you. Okay, as I mentioned, um, I'm at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, but my background is actually in herpetology, hence the frog. Um, but the work that I do now is really looking at a field-wide perspective, some of which I had done in conjunction with the Association of Science Technology Centers through an NSF grant called Communicating Climate Change. And uh, among many of the other things that I was able to do on that project, I worked um, under the, at this time, under the direction of my colleague uh, Karen Cooper, who's here in the audience, to do an investigation of the impact of this citizen science in which we were engaging volunteers in science centers around the country. What was the impact of that actually on our understandings of uh, climate change and the science of citizen science related to climate change. And Karen has just um, published that research, um, a, a gist of it being that we really underappreciate the value of citizen science. And just in the context of migratory birds related to the impact of climate change, up to 50% of what we knew, what we know is wholly due to observations made by volunteers. And part of the reason that this is really underappreciated is that we haven't always used the term citizen science. There's so much work that's been done by amateur naturalists going back as far as the Christmas bird count, some of the Lab of Ornithology's early projects that have just now in the past um, 10 or 20 years or so begun to coalesce under this common term around which we can now mobilize and recognize and point to the power of this work for science and more. And I'll come back to the communicating climate change work with science centers in just a moment, but I wanted to say briefly also that my own personal research has been trying to understand the value of citizen science for the scientists who have invested their careers in this potentially risky approach to collecting and working with data from volunteers. Um, and what I've really seen is not, and many people know this, this is of course really uh, very evident right now, that citizen science, um, by virtue of enabling and mobilizing distributed observers, really allows otherwise unfeasible research to take place and otherwise unanswerable questions to be asked and pursued. Um, and some of these have to do with um, looking at data that can't be found in other ways over time, over a broad scale, data that may be on uh, residential properties and gaining access that way, um, data about rare or emergent, perhaps invasive species, and also this, this really important point of engaging local expertise and really understanding what, um, what can be known by asking new people. 
But I also um, really need to point to the importance of scientists also as citizens in this process. And the interest that scientists have, um, as Julia was suggesting here, in saving the world, in making a difference. But at the same time, the potential gap that can be seen there, um, as we all know that this is a powerful scientific tool for citizen science, we also believe and know that it can be a powerful learning tool, but we can see a gap between how the public knows and understands the impact of climate change and what the science is telling us. But what I'd like to suggest is that that gap may not be due exactly to the reason um, that we presume um, in terms of public misunderstanding of, of climate change. Rather, I think there's a, a, there's a, a missed opportunity or a great opportunity in front of us right now um, to be making better connections to help connect the dots, um, as Dr. Burkett had suggested here, help people see their piece of the puzzle um, as it fits in the climate change picture. But also, in that grand puzzle that is climate change and citizen science, how can we also use citizen science as a venue for bringing attention to local problems within this big picture as well? Um, and not just bringing attention that, to that, but being responsive to that as well, as Dr. Spinrad was suggesting. What are the impacts of citizen science, uh, of climate change, excuse me, on the lives and livelihoods of uh, the people that we are engaging in these projects? Um, but connecting those dots is really difficult. And one of the things that we learned through the Communicating Climate Change Project um, with the Association of uh, Science Technology Centers is that it's difficult to make the connection between my data and the observations that I'm making here and now to that big picture, um, to understanding what that means in relationship to other data that have been collected over time and space, mm -hmm. even when those other data are available. Um, and to really address that gap is going to take some really new and innovative ways to do things like creative visualizations and models with citizen science that can help tell the story of those collective data points. Um, and this is, for example, a, a map from uh, modeling eBird data demonstrating the migration of um, indigo buntings over time. And because this is really going to take a wide range of skill sets from understanding uh, skills related to data analysis and, analysis and visualization to human-computer interactions um, to real on-the-ground education um, to uh, really even just ensuring the data quality going in, which um, needs to be at the fore of all of this. Uh, I've been part of this move to start the Citizen Science Association, which is uh, bringing together expertise across those different uh, skill sets and engaging the people who are running and managing and designing um, and innovating the citizen science projects moving forward. And the association is um, intending to set high standards and advance innovations across the field to be able to um, provide resources for supporting the best possible citizen science for addressing these complex social technical concerns like climate change. And so just to close, I'm very excited to see um, the agencies so invested in citizen science as part of this work moving forward um, as agencies are really right at the forefront of um, mm -hmm. mediating the social and the technical aspects of climate change as just one example. Hello, before I go into the details of the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program, I wanted to start by describing what I see and others see as uh, the value of citizen science in that what it adds to science, but also the value gained from the public engagement um, through citizen science. Um, I'm, my talk is going to be from the perspective of natural resource management and the environment. So um, as you heard echoed in a, a lot of the words here, uh, many folks do citizen science because there's no other way uh, to get the science done. Uh, it improves uh, geographic and temporal resolution. Um, that's one of the um, recommendations under the National Climate Change Indicators is that they have sufficient geographical and temporal resolution. Citizen science might fill that gap. 
Uh, for example, here in the U.S., hundreds of air and water quality monitoring programs wouldn't, uh, are very dependent on volunteers collecting that information. Uh, speeds up and improves field detection. Julia's example is a great example of that where you can get really rapid information and it can uh, plug uh, into science but also natural resource management very quickly. Uh, it improves data analysis. We can actually harness the brain power of people. We've seen that uh, local and traditional knowledge is really important in this. It can help improve the, the relevancy of location-specific questions, which, can, which is, um, makes the questions more um, useful for natural resource managers and the communities. Uh, citizen science is particularly well suited for interdisciplinary um, collaboration, particularly spanning the biophysical and the social. And, and for, the, for the forest service, that would be the wildland urban interface, for example. Um, citizen science also engages people. This is a really big deal. There's many reasons people use citizen science to engage people that, uh, that might be th things such as education, empowerment, environmental justice. Um, but it also promotes, to uh, be more specific, it promotes collaboration. It can bring people together with organizations in collaborative ways, creating synergies and improving the quality of outcomes. The participatory nature of citizen science can facilitate the inclusion of diverse perspectives and and decision making. It can prompt um, volunteers to have a greater sense of place and care about the issue in which they actually make, might make some behavioral changes. Um, citizen science is inherently a social endeavor. They communicate and disseminate this knowledge to friends, colleagues, um, and, and through social networks. Um, some questions that are important for local management on policy may not be addressed otherwise. Um, engaging volunteers in citizen science projects allows an organi organization to connect the people with its mission. This is really important for the for federal agencies. Uh, citizen science, lastly, can increase uh, public understanding of a particular issue by helping volunteers better under access and understand the scientific information that's being generated. Perhaps the greatest um, strength of citizen science is the nexus of between science and the resulting uh, effects of public engagement. I'm going to give an example uh, from my, my life. Um, so right out of high school, I joined a citizen science program uh, that was uh, sponsored by the Forest Service in which I was tasked to collect a, uh, crickets. Um, and so during this process, I discovered a new species of cricket, uh, which advanced science. But also, it was this sense of discovery was so exciting for me, I, it, it really inspired me to eventually get a PhD in ecology. So that, that's um, an example of where these connections can make. Um, so um, back to this figure, um, in natural resource management context, decision makers both have to, have to consider both scientific information and public input. Citizen science can strengthen these connections leading to sustainable management in an adaptive management cycle. Um, citizen science, in particular, has a big impact on public engagement, which can uh, influence, and Julia touched on this a bit, um, people's behaviors. They can go through uh, formal public input processes into decision making here, or they might indirectly um, support the ultimate outcomes of this decision process or they might change the behaviors. For example, if, if um, someone was uh, collecting water quality samples um, near a local water body and they discovered that the eutrophication that they're seeing is due to uh, runoff from uh, their the neighborhood's lawns, they might change their uh, practice. They may not uh, uh, use fertilizer anymore. So this connection with the environment is really key and it might in, um, uh, create some behavioral changes. So all this collectively, um, this impact, this engagement, uh, collectively uh, facilitates the adaptive management cycle. So now I'm going to go into briefly about the, the program I'm going to be talking about today is a collaborative forest landscape restoration program. It uh, explicitly encourages collaboration, science-based ecosystem restoration, uh, priority forest landscapes. I forgot to mention this is um, administered by the Forest Service. Um, 
It promotes ecological, economic, and social sustainability. This, the, the primary focus of the program is reducing uncharacteristic wildfires, in which uh, climate change is a major driver. Um, it's a, a rather robust program. $40 million are being allocated um, annually, but that's just appropriated dollars. They're partner dollars um, that actually make this a bit bigger. Um, so uh, to, to date, there's about 23 projects. Um, the, the program requires that the, the um, management activities and outcomes are monitored for 15 years via multi-party monitoring and citizen science. Um, there's five indicators. Um, the, there's an uh, ecological indicator that has various components. Uh, there's economic uh, indicators, and because this is the context of the Forest Service and the lands we manage, it's uh, fire cost jobs and leverage funds, and there's a social indicator looking at the quality of collaborations. So I want to highlight a specific project. Um, this is the Uncompagre Plateau project. It's uh, occurring in uh, southwest uh, Colorado, and it's a public and private partnership um, interagency effort. Um, and so these are the type of uh, questions that are being asked. Uh, here, just want to give you a flavor of what they look like, and, and embedded in this is a bunch of research questions that are being asked, um, but these are the overarching questions of the projects. Um, and here are the, some of the outcomes. Um, some of these are social outcomes and some of these are ecological outcomes and management outcomes. But one of the things I wanted to emphasize here is that this wouldn't be this uh, pub effects of public engagement is really, really critical in achieving uh, management outcomes on, on the ground. So to wrap up, I think the CFLRP uh, is an interesting example of an institutional framework that's already addressing climate change to some extent um, and the impacts of climate change. In particular, it's developing the science but also building on the value of public engagement. Uh, such as education and, and uh, social capital. And so if you are interested in, in learning more, um, this is a shameless plug for um, a, a paper that some of the panelists here are on, but also uh, some people in the audience. Um, and this will hopefully be coming soon where I highlight some of the, discuss this in a little bit more detail with others. Thank you. So I'll start with one question, um, and there will be plenty of opportunity to take questions from the audience, so be thinking about um, the questions that you want to ask, um, as well as from social media. So if folks that are uh, watching um, on the webcast also uh, have a question, you can tweet that to indicators sitsai, uh, hashtag indicators sitsai, and uh, we'll make sure to flag that question as well. So um, I'll go to a question that was asked by our um, introductory uh, speaker, which was uh, how you each believe that uh, we should be engaging the public in the indicator system specifically. So this is low-hanging fruit initially, and potentially in a perfect world, if the public was engaged in an indicator system in a robust way, where we're getting all of these outcomes that we've spoke about, spoken about on the panel, um, differentiating between what we think we could start with, not sacrificing the, the good for the perfect, <laughs> or the, the perfect for the good, um, that uh, uh, to get kind of started with this work um, with the indicator system. And anyone go first. I'll, I'll start just go ahead. very briefly, two short answers. Uh, the long, lo, <laughs> excuse me, low hanging fruit um, is to listen. Um, I think people are already making very astute observations and well aware of change. Um, and if we put our ears to the ground, we'll, we'll hear and learn of more data sets um, and more uh, potential data sets to follow up on. And in the long term, uh, sort of bridging off of something Dr. Spinrad said, um, to co-create. And this is something um, with the question towards outcomes of citizen science. Um, some work that I, I've been involved in with colleagues looking at the potential impact of citizen science on learning outcomes in particular um, work work led by Rick Bonney and my colleague Tina Phillips at the Lab of Ornithology uh, suggests that the deepest learning outcomes happen when uh, people are really invested in the full process of scientific investigation. And what a great opportunity here at the, uh, at the forefront of climate change research to really listen and learn together and co-create these investigations. 
So I'll, I will back that up. Um, certainly, I personally believe that the indicator is dead birds. Um, <laughs> should be right at the top. Um, and that's because, honestly, if you can get people to do that, imagine what you could do with something that was slightly more um, charismatic. Uh, so I, I think that in a way that really echoes what Jen just said. Um, for me, citizen science is well beyond the citizen as a data messenger, um, as, a, as a collector, as somebody who goes out and gets a piece of information and literally mails it away, and that's their, that's their part. Um, of the science process. Uh, I think that citizen science is most effective and certainly within a policy context when you engage the brains um, of those people so that you are um, involving them quite directly in your own, as a scientist, science process. And then you're giving them back the information uh, at a spatial and temporal scale that they might not be able to see just themselves. And in doing so, you create far more science literate people. And that, of course, is really good for science. If dead birds are the indicator, then things are not looking good for climate change next Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the national parks, of course, are very highly protected areas. And you can't just walk in and start collecting data. Um, but you have to do it in with careful planning and collaboration with the park staff. Um, the Park Service has a whole network around the country of inventory and monitoring efforts and um, with elaborate sets of protocols for monitoring any number of um, things from air quality to water quality to phenology in some cases. And I think um, there's some internal conversation that really needs to happen within the Park Service to get that science program um, to start thinking much more actively about how to engage citizens, park visitors, in collecting those sorts of data, um, perhaps through slightly modified protocols that still yield um, useful information. And I think the paper that um, Duncan, you, and Abe, and 40 other people wrote um, is going to be really, really, really important for getting that message um, circulating within the Park Service so that some, that, that internal conversation can really happen. Um, I would love to see a lot of, a lot of the um, citizen science that happens in the Park Service related to climate change is around phenology, and of course that's one of the indicators. Um, but I would love to see non-biological things like ground truthing, snow patch size, or uh, I don't know if the, the weather app, it's raining, it's snowing. Um, could be used in parks. That would be that would be another good and useful way of doing that. So um, I would echo a, a lot of the uh, sentiments um, by the other panelists. Um, what Jennifer said is listening, and that's really really key. Um, the, the the Forest Service um, is emphasizing collaboration in this process, where there's um, a really deep listening with uh, partners and and the, the public, um, and what we've learned through that is that um, we have national guidance as to what the indicators might be, but to be most effective in terms of attracting interest and participation is that each each project has the flexibility to um, to decide what their own indicators are. Um, they need to be local. They need to be relevant. Um, the real challenge here is how do we now scale that back up? to a national scale. Um, um, and what we're finding is a lot of the uh, partners and participants are identifying more things they want to monitor than there are actually people to monitor them. So there's a lot of excitement, a lot of interest. Um, and, and I guess um, what I'd say is uh, the opportunity here is to try to, you know, uh, um, narrow down the number of indicators, but also coordinate somehow um, um, broadly, nationally, maybe even internationally, so that these indicators are not just place-based and being specific. They can actually be useful um, elsewhere. Thank you. Do we have a question from social media? Yeah. So this question is from 
uh, Sarah, who works on NASA School. And she's wondering, uh, they have a 17-year project with citizen science data on uh, satellite cloud data from students. And they're wondering, how do they make the connections within the community to make sure that their data streams get connected with some of these other projects that they're hearing about? So this is a, I can take a stab quickly at the uh, connecting remote sensing data to local data uh, part of the, the question, um, but then other folks feel free to chime in as well. Um, actually, in uh, at chatting earlier with um, the folks that um, are working on the Coco Ross project that was mentioned earlier, um, one of the things that's so interesting about that particular project that's taking localized um, uh, precipitation measurements, um, 10,000 people every day are taking measurements with that project, which is amazing. Um, and you can see the updated information on, he showed me on his phone, <laughs> the updated information, um, you can see it, it coming in every day. Um, but the GPM project at NASA, so that's the global precipitation measurement um, instrument um, that NASA is using to take global precipitation measurements um, around the globe is actually leveraging that data for um, ground truthing um, as well um, in their project. And so um, I would encourage those uh, students also, if they're not already plugged in with or are thinking about what remote sensing um, programs are also taking similar information, a way to try to understand if they can be um, uh, tied in with those NASA researches is to understand if we actually have any satellites that are taking similar measurements at this point um, as well. So um, that's one thought. Are there additional thoughts from the other panelists for the classroom? Uh, yeah, a couple of quick thoughts. Um, part of the efforts of the Citizen Science Association are really to address some of the related concerns in this rapidly growing field. So many projects are springing up. Um, and to try to reduce duplication of efforts, as well as to bring convergence um, to findings from data sets in different taxonomic groups of biotic and abiotic indicators. Um, and there's work to be done on that latter point, certainly. That's, that's a frontier to really bring data sets together to start asking questions. Some work to that end um, has been done through the Data One initiative, um, which is a, a very large scale um, federally funded effort to um, encourage best data management practices, including archiving and making available and providing metadata for a data set so that other people can find it and make use of it. But I would say engaging as well in um, interagency and cross-agency conversations that are already taking place to um, just be part of setting opportunities to bring those data sets together. Do we have any other questions from social media? Um, yeah, actually a related question we've gotten is, uh, to what extent can K through 12 students be participants in co-creating investigations? I think these are the future scientists and engineers of America that are asking uh, that question. That's great um, to see that students are interested in actually being part of the co-creation process at that age on the, the questions as well. And there are certainly great opportunities for that. Sorry, I don't mean to be the one always chiming in here. There's um, uh, great opportunities from individual projects that support student inquiry. Um, many curricula are available um, through some NOAA projects. I know our own uh, Bird Sleuth program at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology really facilitates that. And I would advocate for things like the teacher workshops that I mentioned that are happening down in the Smokies. Um, if you get teachers, really good science teachers, um, or even non-science teachers for that matter, who are really inspired by this and create opportunities for their students then to um, help conduct um, and set up a project in their schoolyards or in their, you know, in their city and town or in their, in their backyards, absolutely. And uh, there is actually an example um, of this uh, with a middle school classroom that was looking to become asteroid hunters. So it was more on the astronomy side of the equation. But um, they uh, uh, were aware of um, uh, the ability to actually look through some Catalina Sky Survey imagery to identify potentially other uh, hazardous asteroids with that imagery that the algorithms were, algorithms were missing. They worked with Catalina Sky Survey to actually set up um, a, a citizen science project based on finding new um, potentially hazardous asteroids um, with that particular um, uh, uh, survey that was actually capturing that information. And it, a lot of that come, came back down to that middle school teacher that had incredible energy 
and she facilitated a lot of that project uh, for her students that ended up discovering some new potentially hazardous asteroids in that data set. Jen, can I just add one more thing? Um, I will say right now I'm also part of, a, of an, uh, an effort to look at citizen science um, in 4-H context, a USDA program um, through extension, and looking at how citizen science can provide um, an opportunity for youth to identify with science as a tool that they can use in their lives and in their communities to make a difference, to be drawing attention to change and to be leveraging the tools of science to um, bring some attention to making a difference. That's great. Do we have any other questions from social media? No. Nope. Okay. Yep. So um, at four o'clock, um, just so that the online folks here, four o'clock, the uh, online portion of the webcast is going to end, and it's three fifty-eight. So <laughs> in two minutes, uh, we'll lose the folks that are watching online. The discussion will continue in room um, with folks that have continue to have questions in the room. Um, uh, but just so that folks, when we say goodbye in two minutes, <laughs> you know that that was happening. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, since there's no other social media questions before we get to the in-room questions, I'd like to ask um, kind of one follow-up question uh, based on uh, Dr. McKinley, some of the observations that you made in response to the first question, which is um, when you think about the whole area for potential in this space, but you also recognize having, peop having been people that have worked on these projects um, and have run into the challenges of conducting um, these types of um, activities. What words of um, wisdom or caution, two flavors of the same word, <laughs> might you offer to um, uh, the community as they're thinking about identifying this set of indicators and the ways in which it may be realistic initially and in the medium term and in the long term mm -hmm. to engage um, uh, with citizen science in ways that are, have quick wins at the beginning and continue to build the use case? for um, uh, building more and more of this in a sustainable way into these, um, these broader programs. Okay. So um, I guess what I would say is um, thinking about it is people are going, if you want to um, facilitate people getting involved in the projects, there's a little bit of a, a me component in there. Um, how is this going to inform what I see every day from my house or the, the forest or national park or public lands or private lands that I might own? And um, so I think not losing the connection with people um, is, is really key. And the challenge there is um, looking at the um, national climate assessment indicators and elsewhere is they're really great um, ideas in there um, and how do we marry those great ideas that would advance the, our scientific knowledge with um, how we're going to actually get these things done on the ground how are they going to get measured because you know one, one of the things I've been thinking about is there is becoming so much information and there's so much of a monitoring need it's um, it's in, almost requires that we have a large amount of uh, public participation, not only to get the scientific information that we need, but then, you know, supporting the outcomes of that information in terms of policy development and implementation and behavioral changes, which are so key. Um, and so that that's really, I guess, the, the, the in my mind, kind of the, the, the thing that we have to reconcile is what's going to be have impact um, in local communities, um, regions, and how do we connect that in a coherent way that can advance the science but also, you know, you know garner uh, public engagement and the appropriate amount of public input. So I don't know if I answered all the questions, but I kind of... Yeah, I think that one of the uh, realizations that I came to certainly in, in years of working in communities is that uh, science can be for everybody. It, it isn't owned by any one sector. Uh, it's, uh, it's a truly diverse thing and it's also quite politically diverse. And so in 2005 when we had a large die-off of, um, of seabirds, of marine mammals along the 
Pacific Coast, I had as many um, asks for uh, speaking engagement from local chambers of commerce as I did from Audubon groups. And they wanted to know the same kinds of things. They wanted information about how they could get involved in collecting information at their own local geographic community based scales that, that put them more in the driver's seat of working with the resource managers at the state and at the federal level um, that, they, that they perceived, chambers of commerce, perceived as, as getting in their backyard, and Audubon groups perceived as not being in the backyard enough. Um, but but at, at the base level, these are groups of people who want information about change that they perceive that's happening in their community. So I think it's actually less of a question which indicator, which indicators are you going to get somebody to measure, and more a question of how do you connect uh, those those data streams or those potential data streams to what communities care about. But that's the, to me, that's the coolest thing about citizen science is you have the potential to engage, especially if you have a, a multi-channel data stream, you have the potential to engage every single person in a geographic community. They are not all going to be out collecting dead bird data. I'm sorry to say. Uh, but but, not, but not they are... Yet. <laughs> Not yet, yes. right? But they are gonna um, they are gonna collect things that that they care about. So so imagine that at every Starbucks, you've got a whole set of people who bump into each other, who are neighbors, who didn't even know it, who are out collecting different data streams and can start to talk to each other about what they're seeing at a local scale. I mean, that is the essence of science, and 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 that is ultimate science literacy. So that's a goal, I think, that that citizen science can actually achieve. Other thoughts? We'll go out to the audience then, right there. Um, well, I've been excited by what I'm hearing in terms of people interested in the data as well as the impacts on people and the behavior change. But I just wanted to point out that in a lot of projects there is a, a huge skew in participation. Right, it's kind of like we see on Wikipedia, everybody reads it, but very few people contribute. And so, like, just to follow up briefly on what you were saying, Julia, I think, yes, it would be great to have people who are collecting data all be connecting, but I think it's equally or even more important to think about how those data are used potentially by really wide audiences. And that's participation in citizen science, too. It doesn't have to be that you're the one collecting data but that you can know how to use those data resources. Um, and so I guess just related to that, if I was going to turn it into a question, <laughs> I've only seen a little bit of research so far on sort of onlooker effects, behavior change from onlooker effects or peripheral learning. And I just wonder if anyone could comment sort of on, on those directions because, because there is such a skew in actual participation. Let me ask a clarifying question on your question. When um, when you say a skew in participation, do you mean there's a silent majority, or do you mean are you speaking about a diversity and inclusion issue? No, I'm saying that I'm saying very few people contribute a huge amount of data, and then a lot of people do nothing or contribute a tiny amount. So the engagement is very different in most projects. Maybe not, maybe not with yours, <laughs> but that's what's reported for a lot of projects. Is this like Kind of like the rule of the what the th rule of thumb, like the ninety nine one. Right. Rule. Yeah. You know. So uh, I can speak knowledgeably about my own project. We've actually done quite a lot of analysis on that exact point. Um, what's the what's the level of participation, and what is that um, distribution of uh, of participation look like across all of the participants? And the and the yeah, and the um, uh, the participation is actually not so skewed towards the few that do the most. It's it's more in the other direction. So it's a much more egalitarian project in that sense. That 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 is there are a lot of people that are contributing a, a medium amount, and that's the vast 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 majority. Um, of people, and so when you add up all of that data, it's the middle guys, 
You know, it's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It's the middle guys that 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 actually win. Um, and so I, I, I guess I would say to your first point, which I think is a fabulous one, that what are the other ways of, of participating and how can you get communities um, of, of practice as well as geographic communities to participate in use, uh, I, I would say that that is really, really crucial. So for many of the partners that we have in our program, um, especially local community partners and definitely our tribal partners and our Alaska Native community partners. Um, the partnership from the community, from the tribe, is much stronger if we have um, tribal members that are participating in data collection, um, and, and that's for obvious, obvious reasons. But the, the tribes and the local, more um, rural uh, communities really want the data, uh, and they want it um, in, in particular kinds of ways. Uh, so they don't want raw data. They're not particularly interested in being geeked out with Excel and doing statistical analysis. Um, but they're very, very interested in, um, in data that can show them the pattern of change um, in their communities. And so I, I think that it's incipient upon scientists and resource managers to to make that connection, to realize that the audience for the science that we're producing is not just the scientific community. That's the, that's the tip of the iceberg. Other insights before we go to the next question? Nope. Uh, let's go to the very back of the room. Hi, I'm Ellen McCauley from the National Science Foundation, and I actually wanted to add to what you were speaking on. Um, one of the themes that we're coming across in terms of uh, National Science Foundation proposals coming in and what has been funded is now looking at a, a participation ladder and the asking the question of how do you get people to start with data collection and then end up at the co-creation level or at least the data analysis, um, exploring questions. So, you know, if you take everything from um, I'm going to go back to one of the projects, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, when you talk about conjunctivitis in birds. Or, Julia, if you want to talk about all of a sudden you had your, a lot of dead birds and, and people are reporting it, they went from data collectors to seeing patterns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So some of the projects we're funding right now, one is in um, Puerto Rico, another one, uh, uh, one is with adults in Puerto Rico uh, with water quality, um, bats, Beach erosion, it's, it's five different components. It really is looking at the career, at career tra excuse me, not career ladder, though <laughs> some of them are now, are now scientists that started off as citizen scientists, but the participation ladder within citizen science and where to, how, do you get, how do you start here and be become more central? Another one is with youth, um, with the Ocean Discovery Institute in California. So I think that's one of the trends that we're seeing. We're seeing more proposals in that regard. And I, I'd like more comments either from the audience or from the panelists of how you're thinking about those strategies and building those in. Because obviously the National Science Foundation doesn't fund anything that doesn't start with great science. Um, but that learning component and that trajectory component is a theme and I'm interested in what other people are doing in that regard. Thank you. Anyone else want to chime in from out there to that question from the audience? We're not on webcast now. It's just okay. us. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll leap in, but I'll bet Jen has um, some good stuff to say as well. Uh, one of the things that we have been finding um, in, in our own project and then more generally um, doing a survey of, um, of coastal citizen science projects along the West Coast is uh, just the same as uh, scientists do. So, so science proceeds because you, um, you see a pattern, you wonder about it, um, you uh, construct a hypothesis, and that gets you into the scientific method, which is a um, career generating tool. Um, so uh, our citizen scientists uh, develop mental models that they didn't have before. So uh, they get in training. So you, you recruit them. They're, they're trained in your program, and they're collecting information. And again, they're thinking about that information, and they're storing that information, uh, and they're developing a, a, 
a very personal model of what they think is going on in the environment. And they actually update that model. So we've been able to, for instance, test our own volunteers uh, and, and um, get them to reveal what their mental model, in, in our particular case, uh, we can ask them questions about um, what they would expect to see annually on the beach. And we can ask them about common species and we can ask them about rare species. And they actually get it right, which is amazing because when you ask that same question to a set of PhD ornithologists also along the West Coast, they don't get it right. Um, so the scientists uh, with the street cred don't get it right. The people that are on the beach collecting the information do get it right. And when you test their mental model against a question of, well, what's that based on? For instance, is it just the last year or is it a set of years? That is, do you, is your model an average? Um, the answer quite clearly is it's an average. So you can prove that people do exactly what scientists do. They collect information, they de develop a model, they continuously test and update that model. And I think that the learning sciences um, field is just, just, just beginning to catch up with this. Um, and I, so I think it's really exciting to think about um, being able to uh, look, look at people in, in that way, understand um, how much they know about the environment, uh, and, then, and then use that. Um, just to, to Ellen's point briefly, I'll, I'll share a story that I know she's um, familiar with. One of the projects that I point to always as a model of co-created citizen science um, is a water quality monitoring project run out of central Pennsylvania called the Alliance for Aquatic Resource Monitoring, or ALARM for short. And what ALARM does is, um, act as a service provider to local communities who have an issue of concern and want to use data to address that problem. And ALARM uh, facilitates data, um, the, the entire research process from designing protocols um, with the communities around the questions and concerns that they address, all the way to through the process of um, helping people tell the stories in their data um, based on their local insights of what's where and where they uh, suspect there may be problems happening. And so um, I guess, Ellen, one thing that I would see as a potential um, is that oftentimes with citizen science, especially when we're talking about um, the national indicators of climate change, for example, is that we have these national scale projects that just don't have the capacity or the reach or the, the presence to be doing um, the listening on the ground, to be, to be working with and responding to communities in the way that we might want to. And so, uh, I think there's a real frontier here that's starting to be served, um, um, but the potential for intermediary organizations like science centers, like nature centers, um, to fill that gap, to be listening to communities, to be responding to concerns, um, to finding places and instances where citizen science projects can be brought to bear um, to answer questions and concerns related to livelihoods, related to resilience, um, and at the same time bringing more voices into um, the citizen science conversation and more data to inform these, these larger trends. And it's by that listening and responding role that I think has to be done at the local and the community level that will start to um, move people up the participation ladder, not in a gratuitous way just to say we've done it, but in a meaningful way um, that does justice to the science and to uh, the community members who are participating. Um, we'll go back out for another question in just a moment. Um, before we get there, um, tomorrow these folks are going to be spending a lot of time thinking about this question of climate indicators related to the National Climate Assessment. And when we talk about um, uh, citizen science and crowdsourcing and opportunities and challenges and interesting research questions and um, near-term opportunities. Perhaps um, some of the panelists may have thoughts about the frame and ways that we could lay out the opportunity for folks to be thinking about tomorrow. So one way of thinking about that, as I dissect my own long sentence, would be um, uh, there are opportunities to think about around the collection side. There are opportunities to think about on the 
uh, uh, processing or kind of um, uh, 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 analysis side. There are opportunities to then think about on the uh, uh, potentially on the um, uh, 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 if you think about the phases of the data collection publication process then ending in use. So on the use side, which may be completely separate from the collection and the analysis for the, its intended primary purpose, there could be these other ten, uh, secondary benefits. So um, that might be one way of thinking about giving people a frame to think about opportunity areas to specifically identify um, areas for um, opportunity in the climate indicators project. Where, how else would, would you all think about that? What's your mental model? If you were to be asked the question of where would, how would you think about where there's opportunity for citizen science in this indicators activity, how would you frame your thinking? And it's a hard question, so I'll give you just a moment. <laughs> the folks that have a question could raise their hand just so that I can understand where everyone's at. Okay, so we'll get you, and then I think there was one in the back too. There were two right there before we end. So quickly, if you have thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. I guess I, just from the, the sort of parks perspective, um, you know, individual national parks mean certain things to people. Um, and so I guess I would think about where in the national park system one can really focus in on doing citizen science around particular indicators. and. Again, this is an internal conversation in the Park Service, perhaps, but I think it's also with local and national partners like the National Phenology Network is um, where, you know, which parks would be really good places, have the best opportunities to get people engaged in those particular indicators. Um, um, you know, what can be done in Everglades? Well, sea level rise. How can we do a really cool um, public engagement in sea level rise science project in that particular park versus what could be done in Yosemite. Maybe it's air quality. Um, and so to have those targeted conversations with key park staff and key park partners um, very specifically about potential um, indicators that can be um, that can be monitored through citizen science projects in those parks with those communities. So a geographic cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Other thoughts? Well, I, I, um, I guess I would take a, a slightly different tact. Um, I, I think that trying to think about how to uh, give people more opportunities to enrich their own knowledge of the system that they live in, um, connect perhaps a little bit to the concepts of ecosystem service and ecosystem function. Um, th these are concepts that uh, pervade every habitat from urban habitat to exurban wildlands um, habitats. And then um, the other point that I would make is one of the things that we, uh, are discovering a lot is that for, for many of us growing up um, and thinking about scientists and picking up the per first frog, um, we approached science um, and uh, still approach science from an attitude of, of wonder, of, of true inspiration about being out in the natural world and deriving a lot of pleasure and a lot of sustenance uh, from, from that interaction. But many of today's youth are completely and utterly bombarded by um, environmental issues and environmental disasters. And they hear it uh, no matter where they go, uh, in school, from the media, from the social media. So they are approaching science and the natural world from a position of worry. And so when we think about indicators, and particularly indicators of climate change, there is a big worry there. And so it's worth thinking about making sure that there's wonder still um, in science and in the natural world. I think that that's one of the points that Tim made so strongly about national parks and what national parks can do. And so to involve people and basically put this really awful weight of 
it's climate change, it's climate change, it's climate change. No wonder people are, are, are turning away. So there are so many other strong connections that we can make to science. And we can also point out that all change is not bad. Change is just change, right? And it's going to have a set of consequences, and we have to think about what those are. But allowing people to um, have their fingers, have their hands on the pulse of the, of the system, of the function of the services, and derive that wonder um, and worry, I think, is really important. All right, just quickly to that point, I think that, um, yes, but citizen science is also a tool yeah. that they can use to address the problems that they're seeing and helping people both see and use that power, mm -hmm. um, and not just youth um, communities at all levels. Sometimes I think citizen science, uh, too many people think of it as, as youth. I'm not saying anyone here necessarily, but in the broader population, it is something that we are all engaged in, um, all ages. Um, but I also wanted to point us, potentially, make sure that the conversation tomorrow goes beyond the natural sciences, mm -hmm. um, and that we're looking at things like public health mm -hmm. and asthma rates and uh, changing levels of pollution. You mentioned air pollution um, and economics uh, that may be related to, may or may not be related to populations to climate change. So keeping that frontier open and, and aware and part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, there was a question that I had right there, blue jacket, in the middle. And then we'll just pass it next to you after you're done. Hi, Susan Cook Patton. I'm a AAAS fellow at the US Forest Service. Since we're talking about climate change indicators and um, some of our decision makers don't always believe that climate change is happening, I'm wondering in your experience or your opinion, if citizens are collecting the data that's documenting change, does that make decision makers more likely to accept it because it's their constituents that are gathering the data? Or does it make it easier for them to poo-poo it because they think it's collected by people who are potentially less trained than scientists? <laughs> are we still on camera? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, we are. Okay. <laughs> we discovered. Okay. So uh, can I put a, a slight twist on that? Is that, yeah, we can talk about this in terms of change, but I think we need to talk about this in terms of impact. Mm -hmm. We are documenting the evidence of, of impact um, that people are experiencing, experiencing in their lives. And there's been some work in the science communication literature um, that has pointed to the state of Florida very conservative state of Florida, um, being one of the states that has effectively leveraged um, funding towards addressing impacts of climate change because they were coming at it from the, from the direction of impact, mm -hmm. not from the direction of climate change. This is what we're experiencing. This is what we need help with. This is also where it's important, just like was illustrated in the project that you were mentioning with Coast, <laughs> to have a real scientific basis underlying the data that's being collected by mm -hmm. participants. Mm -hmm. So any of that data that's been taken could, someone could go back and take those three measurements and re-verify that yes, that bird that they identified is the bird um, uh, based on verification of that data. So um, having kind of robust method built into the way in which you're collecting that data helps a lot with the quality question, of course, as well. I, yeah, I think that's right. I, th I, I think that um, making sure that there is always a really solid scientific foundation, um, r regardless of how contributory through to co-created something is, um, uh, you have to fall back, I think, on, um, on good, rigorous science. I think that w with respect to um, what a politician might say, they're probably as fast and loose with the numbers as scientists are when we're trying to make a statistical point. Uh, I would say my experience is that when people get directly involved in collecting information 
that allows them to create a stronger picture of what they're seeing in front of them, um, that, uh, that it becomes more about impact, right? And I, I think the science communication, the framing of climate and climate change has, has been horrifically bad. I mean, just, just terrible. And so it, it sets up, to me, a bunch of red herrings, a bunch of false dichotomies. It, it, is, about, um, it is about impact. It is about change. It is about shifts, right? It is essentially about natural pattern um, and, and what's happening. And everybody can get involved in that. And because you are involved in that documentation doesn't mean that you're uh, a climate change enthusiast or naysayer, it merely means that you know more about what's going on, right? So if, if what's going on in your community is coastal erosion, so much so that, as in Shishmarif uh, on the coast of Alaska, your community is washing into the sea, you're not calling your senators to talk about climate change, you're calling your senators to talk about the fact that your houses are going away. So when you get to, to impact and consequences, whether they're natural science or social science or economic, whatever they are, I think that shift in the conversation and the dynamic is really what we need. I think we have time for the one more um, before we wrap up. Okay, I'm Mike McCracken from the Climate Institute. I was very interested in one of Tim's results in your survey that people didn't mind hearing about change. I was on a Disney cruise, we took our children and grandchildren on a Disney cruise to Alaska, and there was a naturalist from the state on board who talked about fish, bears, and glaciers, and separate talks, and in glaciers they talked about how they're going away, how you can get information from the layers, nothing on why. I took a trip on a helicopter out to a glacier that was going away, and the naturalist there was saying, oh, you know, you can see the scrape marks up there. It used to be here, it used to be there. Again, nothing about why. And I, and I asked, you know, why didn't you talk about why? Uh, the one on the glacier was saying, it's politics, to which I sort of objected in Julia's way, saying it's, no, it's science mm -hmm. and, and everything, and you ought to talk about science. But the other one was, they don't want to ruin people's vacations. <laughs> um, by, by doing it. And, and it, it seems, and I guess I'm, quest I'm wondering if citizen science can help, is they need a, f a frame for explaining what's happening in a way that doesn't make people defensive, that yeah. helps get them to thinking about solutions, to realizing impacts are there, but how do you do it? Because if going out and standing on a glacier is no place to talk about why and what's happening, where is? Mm -hmm. So, so how did your survey come out the way it does? I mean, is the Park Service doing it a different way? Well, just to be clear, the people that you were hearing from, were they National Park Service staff or were they no, private? They were yeah. Disney, well, <laughs> yeah. And a local tour company. Right, right. I can't speak for Disney company employees. Um, uh, but to your larger point, uh, you know, the Park Service is 22,000 or so employees, um, and sort of not everybody has really understood that, yes, it's okay to talk about climate change. Um, and we do have official messages, I, I use that term lightly, um, <clears throat> but we do have messages that we encourage people to um, disseminate out in the field and engage the public around. Um, but it takes a while. I think for that community of 22,000 people to all sort of understand, oh, okay, this, this really is something that we should be talking about and that we need to be talking about and we can overcome our individual fears of being, you know, shouted down by somebody in our group or um, fears that somebody in our group is going to write a nasty letter to the local um, congressional rep and complain about what the park is teaching people. Um, it, you know, people want to know that somebody high up has their back. Um, but that's happening. It's definitely happening. And more and more, and, and so I should say one of the, quote, official messages um, is that, yes, climate change is happening and humans are causing it. Um, and so you'll start to hear that a lot more in national parks um, by NPS staff. And it's so. easier to do when you see it and it's right next to you. 
Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Short comment. And then instead of my ending remarks, because who wants to hear from me again, um, we'll take one more question from the back because your hand's up been really long, and then we'll conclude after your question. Quick, 30 seconds. Well, it was just in response to that yeah. study done at the Lab of Ornithology uh -huh. that... Uh, just briefly, there was a, a study done on communicating climate change with citizen science that was done at the Lab of Ornithology that did different treatment groups. And so these were people who participate because they're interested in birds, but the treatment groups were, they got a message about climate change that was about climate change. They got one about its impact on people and one about its impact on birds through a citizen science project called YardMap. And I mean, and then basically there was evaluation on it. And the ones, when it was communicated about its impact on birds, because these were people interested in birds, was so successful in terms of people being receptive to it. And that's something for, the citizen science world to think about. I mean, when people are participating because of a particular interest, that's where they're receptive to that communication, where they might really shut it out in, if it's in other forms. Great, thank you. Okay, last question in the back, and we'll have one person answer it, and then we'll give everyone <laughs> applause. Unfortunately, it's not a short question. <laughs> you gotta make it a short question, because I cut so, my time for okay, you, man. Okay. So. <laughs> It was interesting, we have six federal speakers so far, six federal agency representatives um, speaking um, so, so far, and the two uh, keynote speakers mentioned the importance of finding resources sort of outside the federal sphere uh, to maintain this and to sustain this, and we're trying to create a sustained national climate assessment and these indicators, they need lots of data to do that. So I guess my question would be, using Spinrad's mention of the word value proposition. You know, what is the importance of the value proposition? What is it that you bring? And maybe anybody could comment on this. You know, do you feel like, how are you identifying and then following through on value proposition, which is, you know, using a business model for citizen science activities? Hmm. <laughs> well, you, you know, you know the answer to that. You you know as well as I do. It's it's darn tough to keep a citizen science program going, especially for a long time, right? Uh, and and so I I think the message that I heard was not uh, don't look to the federal government. I think the message is do not only look to the federal government, right? It 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 is it is a it is a suite of funders from local to national that will produce something that is that is long term and sustaining and and i think that the point at which we all say for our own projects um, it's the responsibility of the federal government to fund this because it's been funded because it's long term because i think it's important that that that's the point at which failure starts to happen, right? So the value proposition is always, always coming back to that point. Are we doing something that is providing excellent science? Are we doing something that's providing excellent resource management? And with citizen science, are we doing something that's providing excellent engagement and learning and science literacy? And if we can check all of those boxes, I think that we will get federal funding as well as a lot of other dollars. Great, just briefly to answer that and related to value to absolutely piggyback on what Julia said, um, this is hard work <laughs> and we can't underestimate the importance of doing it well. Um, we don't want to devalue citizen science, have it become a buzzword. This is powerful science and it's powerful learning but only if we do make it so. Um, and a lot of people have invested a lot of time and money and federal dollars in doing stuff that is w absolutely worth following up on, um, but it can't be taken lightly. Yep. Thank you, guys. Um, the last word that I will have is if there are other feds in the room that are not currently part of the federal uh, uh, community practice for citizen science and crowdsourcing, Jay and Leah, raise your hand. Uh, find them at the end so that you can join the network of collaborators in the federal government that are seeking to do um, more and more of these activities. So if you'll um, uh, put your hands together for our panelists. <laughs> Have fun tomorrow. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, it's like you guys are so awesome that, you know, just wanted...
you guys to be able to talk <laughs> most of the time.